Welcome to the Real Estate Masters Podcast, where we interview the top names in the real estate game. If you want to grow your real estate business, see more podcasts, or get free resources, go to www.remcommunity.com, the only podcast that allows you to directly connect with the guests in many of the highest level names in the real estate game. You are in for a treat with our next guest. Do me a favor, subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, and don't forget to go to remcommunity.com to connect with some of the highest level real estate professionals in the United States through our community and through our high level masterminds. Let's go. Welcome to today's show. We have Mr. Austin Rutherford out of Columbus, Ohio. On our call here, he is a flipper wholesaler, does rentals. He specializes in raising private money. He's raised millions and millions of dollars in private money. Loves to travel, did 25 vacations last year. My kind of guy. So good to have you on the line, Austin. What's going on in Columbus, Ohio? Absolutely, brother. No, I appreciate you having me on, man. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. It's a, it's a cold, gloomy day here right now. Yeah. Well, that's the Midwest, man, this time of year. I, I left the Midwest five years ago, as I said a little bit earlier today. But sounds like you're wanting to move south into some warm, warmer weather. Um, looking at Florida, huh? For sure. It's, uh, it's getting old quick. Um, so, you know, Cali's a little far. So, you know, East Coast, we're, we're headed down to Florida probably. Yeah, that's cool, man. I, uh, like I said, I did that five years ago, moved, moved to San Diego and run my business remotely from Wichita. And I, I wouldn't change a thing, man. I, I've got a great team out there. It actually allows me to focus on the business being away from it as opposed to being in like the every everyday details. So I think, I think you'll enjoy that if you're a visionary like me. Absolutely. No, I'm looking forward to it. What, what's, what's been your, the, the biggest lesson over the five years? Oh man, you're interviewing me now. So <laughs> well, I, I, uh, one question. <laughs> no, that's sweet, man. I love it. I love, I love turning the table. So um, biggest lesson over the last five years. Um, you know, like I said, I think once I moved, it took me about six months to realize that I wasn't the best at everything, even though I kind of thought I was, um, and that I could let go. So like for the first six months, like every month I wanted to come back, I wanted to look at properties, I wanted to check on the team. And then as I started taking more time away from Wichita and, and spending, you know, more time in San Diego or all my time, pretty much all my time in San Diego, um, I realized that I could let go and my team could, could thrive. And when you have a good team and you, you give them ownership and you let them thrive, um, you know, they'll, they'll do great things. And if you leave and you realize that things are, are starting to decline, that's when you know you maybe don't have the right team. So you may have to, <laughs> to spend some more time going back and adjusting. But uh, I, think, I think if you've got a really good team there, which it sounds like you do, that um, you should be able to transition to another state especially a warm state um without much of a problem no i love that i appreciate that it's let letting go you know I, I i for one have definitely struggled with that in the past totally man it took me over 10 years to really start letting go i've been in business 20 years now and and like i said five years ago i left and it was really hard letting go of the everyday activity but like i said as i got more and more out of the business i realized that i thought i was and that's that's a thing that entrepreneurs think that they do the best at everything because they care the most and they feel like they know the business the most. But the okay. truth is, man, you can find every single thing in your business, find someone else that can do it better than you. And that's when you have a true business because then you don't have to take care of all the monotonous details. You can just look at the business from afar and, and make the uh, big key decisions that you need to. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah. So cool, man. So let's, let's get back to you, man. This is all about you. So I uh, appreciate the, appreciate the, uh, the, the question and flipping it around, but so you're doing about 80 deals a year, which is impressive. Like, like I say on a lot of shows is, you know, a lot of people have trouble finding one deal, their first deal, let alone, you know, doing a high volume of deals like you're doing. So tell us a little bit about um, how you started, kind of how you built the team you have and, and how you um, have, have had success over the years um, scaling up your team. Absolutely. Uh, so I got started about six years ago. Um, you know, met a mentor. He taught me how to flip houses. It was a very long road to that first deal. It was a, it was a 16 month process to make make my first profit in the business. Uh, but after that first deal, uh, we flipped it. It was a hundred and seventy thousand dollar rehab. So massive project for the first deal. Uh, made made a hundred and three thousand dollars net profit on that. 
And then, uh, you know, just literally reinvested all that money uh, back into the business, kind of grew it every year since then. So it was like one deal the first year, you know, seven the second year, 17 the third year. Um, hired an assistant finally then about the third year. Um, we were doing these full debt, you know, $100,000, $150,000 rehabs. Um, hired the assistant and then hired a project manager, fired them. And then over the last, I guess, year and a half or so, we got out of the monster, you know, huge rehabs um, and got more into the, to, we call them wholetails, you know, mm -hmm. twenty to $40,000 rehabs. You know, we can get in and out of those in, in two to four weeks. Um, so we're only flipping, you know, wholesale properties, and then we're starting to keep in a lot of uh, rentals as well. So I'm starting to build my portfolio uh, more, uh, you know, today. So right now we wholesale, uh, we do wholesales, um, and then we buy rental properties. And I used to do new construction as well, but we got out of that too. That's cool, man. So we've talked about wholesaling before. So those who haven't um, haven't heard that term before, it's not wholesaling where you sell the property as is it's not quite retail where you rehab the property and make it like pristine it's somewhere in between almost more towards wholesale usually where you clean it up and kind of make it can make it livable or or at least do some minor things that bring some big returns on on the on the price at the end so i, I love those i've been doing a lot of those uh, a lot of those lately with the the market the way that it is it's really hot as we speak so yeah. um you know, once you put a house on the market, if it's in decent shape, decent price for the shape it's in, man, it goes quick. So, Very so that's smart. And that's return on time too, right? I mean, you know, those big rehabs, I'm sure we're taking probably what, 60 to 120 days, I imagine. Six months construction and then oh. still selling it. So we're in these projects six to nine months at a time. It was, it was, a, that's why I'm losing hair. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. You had full hair when you started this business, right? <laughs> So then, uh, so then you, you probably, you know, wholesaling is what a month to two months, right? You yeah. Know, we're in and out 45, days, and now. Days. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good stuff. So your profits probably go down a little bit, but return on time goes up and, and you can do a higher volume of deals and it's less risky because if the market tanks or, you know, something happens, which hopefully it doesn't, um, you're, you're more covered there. So I think you said before I call one of the things that you specialize in is raising money. Mm -hmm. Um, it's my opinion that if you find a good enough deal, you should be able to raise the money. Like there's enough yep. capital, enough people out there. So tell us about your experience in raising money and yeah. tips you'd give um, our listeners that are looking to raise their first, uh, first round of money. For sure. Absolutely. I'm with you. You know, if the deal's good, the money will be there. The trick is at what rate does that money come in at? So, you know, you can get anybody to fund a deal at, on 50% equity. You know, there's a lot of investors that love doing that because they make a lot of money, you know, for not that much work. Mm -hmm. um, so the trick is, you know, getting them down to, you know, 10%, 8%, 6%, no points, 100% financing. Um, so that, that's kind of the niche that I fell into, um, just, just talking to people and being able to raise money. So the first deal I ever did, like I mentioned, it was a $74,000 purchase and a $170,000 rehab budget. A uh, massive project. I was 21 years old at the time, no real estate, no construction, no business background. And I raised, you know, a quarter million dollars from a private money lender at 12% and two points to fund 100% of the deal. Um, you know, a lot of people say, one, you can't get funded on your first deal. And two, you can't get funded as a 21 year old with no experience. So there, there's plenty of money out there. You know, it just comes down to you and talking to other people to be able to present opportunities and get people to lend. So the, the advice that I always give, the, the big thing for me that changed the game as far as raising money, when I realized that, you know, giving people an opportunity to invest with me was that an opportunity, not, you know, an ask or not a favor, or they weren't, you know, looking out for me, nothing like that. Like I was genuinely giving somebody an opportunity of a lifetime to change their life by investing with me because most of the people that lend to me have no idea what private money lending is. And they're, most of their money's in the stock market, you know, earning three, four, five, six, seven percent, whatever it is. But like, as we saw, like stocks can disappear like that. So me not giving them an opportunity to two or three times their investment with the collateralized asset, you know, is a disservice to them. So when I changed my mindset on that, having the conversations about raising private money, you know, became a, whole lot easier because you're more confident at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. I, I agree with that. In fact, it, it was interesting because I talked to one of my private lenders, gosh, it was about a year ago. And we were having a conversation about something. And he brought up the, the number that I, he's like, you, he's like, you, 
something about, you know, you've paid me 300 and some thousand dollars over the years. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Really? <laughs> so I looked at the numbers and I'm like, holy crap, I paid this guy over $300,000 yep. within a six, seven year period on his money. And it's like, you're right. Once you have that confidence in doing deals and you look at it as an, as an opportunity, it makes it easier because you have that confidence. It's not like, Hey man, I need money. Help me. It's like, no man, I can make you X amount of dollars on your money. Come invest it with me. I'll protect it and I'll back it by real estate. So that's good stuff, man. For sure. I, like I look at it like, you know, you look at a 70 year old old lady that has, you know, $300,000 in her IRA and that's what she's living on for the rest of her life. You know, if that happened in March and, and you were that lady, like you're, you're in a world of pain. Like you just lost you know, $100,000 of your investment. So I look at everybody like that. Like, I don't want that to be my mom. I don't want that to be my grandma. I don't want that to be my sister. So like, you have to understand that you're giving people an opportunity to invest. I mean, think about paying somebody 300 grand in interest. You know, that's, that's literally life changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Big time. And he's just a blue collar worker. He's not a guy that has millions of dollars. I mean, he had a decent amount of money that he was investing, but you know, it's, it's one of those things where if you take them from one to 3% they're earning on their money, if they're doing well in the stock market, maybe on average seven to 10%, but that's an average or some, sometimes when the market crashes and they, uh, you know, they have those moments where they're like, man, I wish I was in something else. So if you can, if you can take their, let's call it 3% money, I would guess is probably the average most people earn to a yeah. eight, 10, 12% return, whatever the investor is paying. I mean, that, that is life changing, especially, yeah. <clears throat> especially if they're, you know, under 50, let's say, and they've got 20, 30, 40 years still invest. I mean, the compound interest of that money coming in is, is pretty substantial. Absolutely. hundred percent. Yeah. So what are some, are there any obstacles you've had or any big learning lessons you've had from raising money? Yeah. So the, the, the coolest thing is like, everybody always asks like, where do you find private money lenders at? Like, can I Google them? Like, no, you can't Google them. That's why they're private. <laughs> and the, the funniest thing is people hit me up like, yo, can you connect me with some of your private money lenders? I'm like, go, go get your own. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, the lesson that I learned is like how to kind of start that. Um, so what I do is I, I purposely go out to eat. I go to go to uh, like country clubs. I go to play golf. I go to car shows. So I put myself around people with money. You know, you're not going to find people with money in the hood on the street. You know what I mean? So you got to put yourself in scenarios where there's money around you. And then the next thing you got to do is you got to create conversation. So I used to be like a really like shy to myself person. Um, I've changed over the years. So now I just start conversation like, hey, man, nice car, nice shoes. Did you see that game last night? You know, that looks like a delicious dinner. What'd you get? Whatever it is, just create the conversation. And conversation always leads to, well, what do you do? You know, they'll either ask me what I do or I'll ask them what they do. And then if I ask them, they ask me in return. So it always comes back to me. And my answer is always one of two things. It's always, you know, I'm a real estate investor and I use other people's money to fund my deals. Or, you know, I teach other people how to invest their money into real estate. So I don't just say, you know, I'm in real estate. I flip houses like that. Someone's like, oh, cool. And then turns around and moves on with their day. You're, the response you're going to get on, well, you know, I'm a real estate or, or I teach other people how to invest their money in real estate. Anybody who's ever had interest in real estate is going to be like, well, what, what do you mean? How do you do that? And now your foot's in the door to be able to have that conversation and present the right opportunity to those people. So the, the big trick for me, like I talk about money to everybody. Some people don't like talking about money. I talk about it all day, every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so the biggest thing for me is just been able to start those conversations and create those relationships with people. Yeah. Some of the, two of the biggest investors that I've ever <clears throat> done uh, or found are conversations that randomly happen. One is uh, at a gym. So it was, it was a pretty, I want to say high level gym is one of the nicest gyms in Wichita and just struck up the conversation. He was probably, I'm guessing 65, seven years old. You could tell he'd probably done well. I don't know. You can just kind of tell sometimes if, you know, yeah. they have that aura and, and I, and he's like, Oh man, I lend money on real estate. And I'm like, and within like, I want to say six or nine months, he had like a million dollars invested with me. Yeah. And then another guy, um, putting yourself with people with money. I, we went on an expensive hike in Switzerland and a couple, um, couple was there and we spent, I think five or six days together and just told him what I did. And kind of like you said, um, I, I mentioned something about how we, you know, use other investors money to do our deals and things like that. And his ears perk up 
And then he's actually not too far from you in Cleveland. And um, yeah, he's invested millions of dollars with us just from one conversation, become a really good friend. So you just never know where the money's going to be and nope. you never know who's going to have money, right? I mean, you could, you could be sitting next to someone that, um, you know, is in gym clothes and, and doesn't look like they have a dollar to their name, strike up a conversation, all of a sudden, you, you, you know, they're a, a Walmart heir or something like that. You know, so. <laughs> no, absolutely. Money's everywhere. You got you to gotta talk about it. You know, if you don't ever talk about it, you're never going to have any. Yep, for sure. So you started with two points and, and I think you said 12% on your first deal. I'm guessing that money, that the cost of money has gone down for you. So what do you, what do you typically propose to your, um, to your private investors and how do you structure that? For sure. So we always ask them like where their money's at and what type of returns they're getting and what type of returns do they want to get. I used to just lead like 12, 14%. And then most people like think that's a scam because it's like too good to be true. And you're shooting yourself in the foot because if they'd be happy with eight and you're paying 14, like you don't have to do that. So I always ask them the questions, but I'm happy to pay eight to 10% flat, no points. Um, I'll pay 12%, you know, once it starts going to 14 or 16%, like it starts to get a little expensive. Um, I don't like paying points at all. And then we get 100% of the deal funded, 100% purchase, 100% rehab. And we also get 100% funded on the purchase. So when we buy it, if it's a $30,000 rehab, we're getting $30,000 in our bank on the purchase to fund the rehab. So those, those are like the terms that I'm happy with. And we don't pay uh, monthly payments. We pay it all at the end of the loan. Uh, we let it accrue until we sell it. So those terms, like I'm, I'm, you know, that's how we do it. And I'm more than happy to pay those types of terms. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, I, I used to do that too, just throw out an interest rate. But when you ask them like, hey, what are you earning now? If they say 1%, <laughs> then be like, okay, well, what would you be happy with? Like if you could just you know, have a killer investment, what would it be? And they may say, you know what, if I can get 5% on my money, I'd be happy. Uh -huh. Bingo. You got yourself a 5% <laughs> lender. Yep. Um, and then um, as far as the interest payments are, are concerned. So I, I agree with you. I think that that is a good way to do it, to have interest at the end of the loan because it helps with cash flow. It's less bookkeeping, you know, that kind of thing. Yep. But what I do is I like to set my investors up on monthly payments because what mm -hmm. happens is if they've got a bunch of other money sitting, once they get about, I swear, once they get about two checks, that's, I swear, that's the magic number. The first one, it's like, okay, this is real. The second one, it's like, okay, maybe I need to start looking at another deal, but definitely by the third check, if the project goes that long, it's like, they're hitting you up for another deal. I promise you, if they've got extra money, it happens. So I think, I, I think there's pros and cons to both, but I like doing monthly payments just because it gets them that taste and then they start investing more money with you. No, I, I can see that for sure. I mean, it's real at that point, you know, it's mailbox money. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Well, thanks for sharing the, uh, the private money. Anything else you want to share about private money before we move on to, uh, to wholetailing and some other, uh, some other topics that I think would be good to get into? For sure. I mean, the, one of the big things that gets uh, my lens, so I always got pushback from lenders, but all lenders are going to be worried about getting their money back because it's something new to them. So they're always going to ask a million questions you know, why this, how that, how do I know you're going to pay me back? What happens if you die? You know, all those things. Um, so something that I've put in place that's helped me a lot, and this may not work for everybody, um, but I just put like a, a high ticket, um, you know, term life insurance policy in place. So, you know, I'm young, so it doesn't cost me much money at all. Mm -hmm. You know, if I can have, you know, multiple millions of dollars of, of life insurance, you know, if anything were to happen and, and if any lenders ask me these questions, I just say, hey, I have blank of life insurance. You know, if anything does happen, like you're you're good. You know, I'm, everybody's getting paid off. So that's been something that's kind of helped me over the hurdle. Um, you know, with, with talking and trying to get people to invest with me. Yeah, no, I like that. Any anything you can do to make your your lenders feel more safe, the the more likely they are to lend, and easier it's going to be, right? Because they're going to trust you more, and it's just. So talk about. Um, so I guess we'll continue on the lending conversation because I've got some more questions. So. Uh, and some more knowledge to share. So like, you know, when, like I lend money now too. So I, I have a gap funding program. If someone needs down payment money, I provide that down payment money because that's a huge need right now. And I don't think there's anybody really out there to fulfill that need. And so okay. what I tell my investors that are dealing with me, I'm like, if you throw me a bunch of garbage, I'm not going to look at it. Like you throw like something that's like, 
Like I've had people like I'd say, send me the, the information and they'll give me like three numbers and I'm like, okay, you know, give me something better. Give me a little spreadsheet, give me pictures, give me something. And they don't, they don't even tell me what they're requesting. Right. Yeah. So I guess just a piece of advice from, from me as a lender is like, you gotta have your stuff together, like get a deal analyzer together to where if someone asks you for that, you've got it. Um, I've got a formatted email that I send out. That's really simple. It's like, um, here's what I'm selling it for, or here's what I'm buying it for. Here's what I'm rehabbing it for. Here's what I'm selling it for. Um, here are the terms that I'm offering. Um, and there's a couple other things that I put in there. And then if they ask for more information, I'll give it to them if they want pictures and things like that. But yeah. honestly, after I do my first deal with them and I pay them off, like the next deal is so easy. I send them an email. I get the money wired within a couple of days. They don't check on me. Yeah. They don't ask for pictures. It's like, it's super simple. So I guess what I'm trying to say is like, have your stuff together. And the more you have your stuff together in the beginning, it's like the easier it is for them to say yes. And you know, it's just, it just, I don't know. It's, it, it just boggles my mind. The, the, the information I get from people that I'm like, if you can't get me the information up front, that is that I can't understand it at all. And I've been in the business 20 years and done a thousand deals. Like you're not going to be able to manage rehab. Like there's no way. So yeah, they'll, they'll send you an email. Like I need 130 grand. Yeah. Okay. Like for what? <laughs> yeah. Can you give me 130 grand? Oh, yeah. Where, where, what are the writing instructions, man? I'll send it right to you, buddy. <laughs> you know, it's like, give me, give me some more, give me some more. So, uh, well, cool, man. So, um, what else? Like, so you, in six years, you've done a lot, man, like doing 80 deals a year after six years, that that's pretty impressive. So tell us what you think has gotten you from, you know, the first deal, you raise your money quickly, which like you said, like a lot of people are like, where do I find the money? It's hard. And, you know, it sounds like you found it pretty easily. So then it, you know, from where you were in your first deal to where you are now, like what are some big things that got you to scale that quickly? Absolutely. Uh, the biggest thing I think is just uh, leverage on a lot of different levels, um, leveraging other people's money and leveraging other people's time. Um, so money is obviously, you know, buying and rehabbing. You got to use other people's money to be able to scale. Um, and the other thing is other people's times. And again, this is multifaceted. So, you know, contractors, I see a lot of, like I used to be the one, like the GC. So I'd be the one running materials. The guys would be working, but I'd be dropping off light fixtures and, and faucets and, you know, insulation and whatever they needed. Uh, so that's what I did like all day, every day. Um, and it was cool. We made money, but I wasn't able to operate a business. Like I was the one running literally all day, every day. Um, so then, you know, I finally got smart and got out of the big rehabs and did the smaller rehabs, hired general contractors to do it. And so hire, leveraging contractors the right way and leveraging a team. So now I have a team in the office. You know, we got an ops person, we got sales guys, we got dispo guys, we got project managers. So being able to have a team run the company um, you know, that that's what at the end of the day lets you scale, um, you know, because each each person has a cap, you know, your cap may be a million, my cap may be 200 grand, whatever it is, each individual has a cap to their income. And the only way that they can surpass that is by leveraging systems or people. And that's the only way you get you make more money at the end of the day. So that's been my biggest takeaway is finally like opening up and being okay with hiring and paying people and knowing that the investment in them is to double my investment. You know, if they're not making you money, they shouldn't be working for you. So that, it took me a long time to get past that fear of hiring people. Uh, but now everything I do, I'm like, all right, who can I hire? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, I, I, <clears throat> I had this conversation with someone the other day. They're, they had a struggle with, they're like, I'm doing Facebook ads. I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And this guy's been in the business a long, like if I said his name, you probably know it because he's, he teaches yeah. in the industry and all that kind of stuff. And, um, I'm like, you just need to start playing hot potato. Like if something comes on your lap, figure out how to get it into someone else's hands. Like that's, that's how I, I'm not saying that's hundred percent right for everybody, but that's the way I like to run my business. Because if I, if I just start taking all the potatoes that come to me and like, I, I mean, they're just going to stack up. It's like, I want to find the person that would be best to, to pass that potato to, they can, they can take it to the finish line. And I like what you said. I like that term. I'm going to start using that other people's time. Like people say other people's money, OPM. I like OPT. I like that. I like that term. That's cool. Um, so it sounds like you built out your team pretty quickly. Like how did you, <clears throat> excuse me, how did you learn how to build that team out? Did you, was it trial and error? Did you hire 
someone to help you build it out? Did you learn from somebody else? I guess, tell us, tell us how you, um, evolved your, your team and, and were able to, to build that so quickly. For sure. Um, I mean, some of it's trial and error, you know, we have a team of five now and we probably hired nine people. Um, so part of it's trial and error for sure. Um, another part of it, you know, I have a friend that uh, has a hiring system, um, that, you know, helped me with, with the hiring process, um, and not, you know, spending 50 hours trying to hire one person. Um, so getting good candidates through the door faster. Um, and then, you know, I've always, I've always had mentors, um, you know, in different aspects of business. Um, some, you know, specifically real estate, some marketing, some business. Um, so, you know, learning from them as well, how to structure and pay team members um, has been big as well. You know, if you hire an acquisitions person, like what, what do you actually like pay them? You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, I've, I've learned from them for sure. Cool, man. Yeah. It's, it's one thing that in the business, so I've been in business 20 years now, it took me at least 10 years to figure out that I, I, I don't need to be figuring everything out. You know, I thought that I needed to figure it out. I'm the leader. I need to figure it out, but man, yep. just leveraging other people. I mean, just like you said, other people's time, it's not just employees and, and, you know, utilizing their time to get stuff done, but it's also utilizing the experience of other people um, to be able to make those key decisions. That's why I love coaching and masterminds. And even one of the reasons I do this podcast too, it's, it's to get our listeners that information, but I soak it up too, man. Like it doesn't matter if someone has done only 10 deals or they've done, you know, thousands of deals. There's still something I know that I can learn, learn from other people. So good stuff, man. Yeah. So what else would you like to share with us? What are some other keys to success? Um, I mean, as, as, as far as real estate, you know, I, like I said, we kind of switched our business model like a year, year and a half ago uh, from 100% you know, full gut rehabs. Um, now, like people say, I run a wholesaling operation, um, but like a wholesaling is just a lead gen for myself, honestly. You know, we actually wholesale, true wholesale, you know, very little properties. Um, you know, we're buying and flipping a decent amount of them. And then we're buying rental properties for a decent amount of them as well. Um, so just being able to like, again, tapping into private money helps us a lot, but being able to maximize, you know, each deal that comes through the pipeline um, and have multiple exit strategies, you know, scaling a strictly wholesale business to multiple, multiple seven figures um, is very difficult to do. You know, yeah. you can take a wholesale business to, you know, hundred grand, 200 grand a month for sure. But, you know, scaling it to a million a month is, is very difficult. You know, in my opinion, you need to have, you know, the big chunks from the rehabs. You got to have the cash flow from the wholesales. And you got to have the long-term wealth from the rental properties. So just being, you know, realizing that chasing that fast dollar, um, you know, is great because you make money. But, you know, keeping in mind your, your future and the generational wealth uh, portion of it as well. So I would say, like, real estate is great, and, but take that money and invest it either into rentals or other cash flow businesses um, so all your money is not based on just, you know, finding that next deal. Yeah, that, yeah, that's why I got into lending, too. I wanted, I love multiple streams of income. I've got, I've got quite a few, but adding that lending piece to it. Um, is definitely, definitely more consistent and, and gets me good returns. And I love helping other real estate investors do deals that they normally wouldn't have been able to do. So, um, Absolutely. yeah, so wholesaling. So let's dive into that. So what does your typical wholesale deal look like? So for us, I'll just give you mine to start off with. So, you know, it's interesting because when we wholesale a deal, you can tell me if you have the same, same thing, but we make as much, if not more money wholesaling a property as we do as a, doing a full rehab. It's the, it's the weirdest thing. I think part of it is it's a hot market. So that, that has something to do with it. And yep. so, you know, I would say our average wholesale, we're doing right, one right now that's probably bigger than most. We're probably doing a 15 to $20,000 wholesale, but it needs like a new lagoon and stuff like that. So that's a little anomaly, but I'd say the typical <laughs> wholesale deal is like three grand, right? We cut, we go in, yep. We don't, it, it's typically not very livable. Like if someone wanted to live in it, they could, but it's, it's things like cleaning all the trash out, giving it a good cleaning to get the smell out of there. Um, it might be um, like if the roof is like one of those that you can tell it's been on there 50 years and it needed to be replaced 20 years ago, we might replace the roof and spend five grand on that just to, it gives it the whole new look. 
Yep. Um, so what does your wholesale deal look like? You said 15 to 20 grand. That's a pretty big wholesale deal, but I'll let you, let you explain. For sure. So like, I, you got to understand, like I grew up, you know, doing hundred, hundred fifty thousand $150,000 rehabs. So like, I could, I could build a house. Literally I knew every code in the code book. I knew how far toilets had to be away from walls, like everything. I'm not proud of it, <laughs> but uh, it was a lot of work. So like doing a 20, 30, $40,000 rehab to me is like nothing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So in theory, we are rehabbing. I just call it wholesaling. Um, but like we'll, we'll do rehabs up to 40 K. Um, you know, our smallest is probably five or 10, like you said. Um, but like we do a lot of 20 to, to $30,000 flips. Um, but we can knock out a twenty to thirty thousand dollar rehab in two to three weeks, get it on the market, sell it thirty days later. So buy to sell or normally less than sixty days. Uh, so you know, I, I guess you can call it rehabbing for the most part as compared to wholesaling. So when you do those lighter rehabs, are they are they usually like in really good condition where everything's updated, or is it more like? where you, you know, maybe keep some things that are outdated and maybe don't do some of the things you would normally do, um, you know, to a hundred some thousand dollar rehab. Yeah. So like, like you said, especially in this market is, is crazy. Like some, like we have a lot of like sixties and seventies houses mm -hmm. here. So like everything's functional, you know, they're just really old cabinets. They're really old, you know, tile surrounds in the showers. So like back in the day, we would rip all that out and replace everything. Um, now, like we might keep the cabinets or paint the cabinets and, you know, instead of ripping out the full, you know, pink tile surround from back in the day, you know, just putting a glaze coat of white glaze on the bathtub and the shower. So instead of, you know, $2,500, spend like $300 and it kind of gives the same end goal. So um, definitely we're keeping more things intact rather than like gutting everything out like we used to do. Mm -hmm. Cool. So what has that done for you? Has that, I'm guessing that's, you know, your, your less project management, less capital investment, uh, anything else I'm missing turnover, you less time on the market. I mean, there's so many different benefits, anything else that you can think of that has, has helped you since you, um, scaled down your rehabs quite a bit. For sure. So, uh, the real reason I did it in the first place was just risk. Um, so when we were flipping a lot of those big rehabs, the market was beginning to get saturated. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the main point is just getting out of those six to nine month deals. Cause a lot of things can happen in six to nine months. Um, so that was number one, but since then, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to manage, you know, putting people in place to manage a $20,000 rehab is a lot easier than a $150,000 rehab. Um, and the biggest thing for me is like mind space you know, not sitting up at night, like, okay, who do I got to call the electrician, the plumber, I got to get the framer back on this job. I got to call insulation first in the morning. Like that, that takes a lot of time away from your day. So having the freedom of mind to go out and create other businesses and create other streams of income um, has probably been the biggest benefit for me. Um, not stressing about, you know, 10, you know, million dollars in construction going on every single day. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, so what is next? So you said other streams of income. So you've got wholesale, a little bit of wholesaling or wholetailing. You've got your retail properties. You've got rentals that you're starting to buy. Anything else you're wanting to add to the mix? Yeah. So we have, we have those, um, you know, I started like a, a brand education side. I started a data company. I started investing a lot of my money into, um, I got some Amazon stores into stocks and the Forex. Um, you know, like I was a hundred percent real estate. Like I was all in on like flipping houses. Mm -hmm. Um, and honestly, like at the beginning of the year when like COVID happened, it, I, it, it was, it, it made me wake up. Um, and I took a lot of money that I had in there, um, and started, you know, diversifying into other businesses, other investments. Um, I started lending a lot more money, like, like yourself. Um, so, you know, just creating as, as many, many streams of income as, as possible. Cause like what my mentor always tells me, like, what got you to where you are, isn't going to get you to where you want to go. So like real estate has been great for me and I've made a lot of money doing it. Uh, but like, again, you can't scale a $50 million wholesale business. So take, take that money and create those other more passive streams of income to get you to your end goal and it gets you to the life that you want. So for me, you know, my, my big push right now is like building the brand. 
Um, so, you know, doing Instagram, you know, doing podcasts, doing social media, doing events, like all that stuff is kind of my main focus. Um, and then the other investments on the side, you know, obviously help with the income as well. Cool. What, um, what's your main source of marketing? How do you find most of your deals? Uh, on the real estate side, uh, we do direct, biggest ones, direct mail and, and cold call. So everyone says direct mail is dead. We're still pulling deals from it. The, the rate, the response rate has gone down drastically. Um, but it, it works still. And then cold calling, um, you know, has, has been huge. That, that's the consistent one. You know, we get leads every single day from cold calling. That's cool, man. There's not a lot of people that, that do cold calling. The ones that do usually get out of it pretty quickly. What is the, what is the, the secret to the success of that? Do you think it's just consistency and sticking with it until you start finding deals? For sure. So we, we hire like virtual assistants to do the actual cold calling and then we just follow up on the warm leads. But most people like start cold calling and they want deals like today. Like you got to understand we're reaching out to people. Direct mail people are reaching out to us. Mm -hmm. So like there's a lot more motivation on the direct mail side and you can have a one called close. But on cold calling, usually it's like a three to six month, you know, follow up. So you got to build your pipeline out. And like you said, a lot of people quit, you know, in, in, in between time. So just staying consistent with it and understanding that deals come down the line and not necessarily just today. Cool, man. Well, good stuff. So we're going to wrap up here. Any last words um, that you want to give our listeners that are either wanting to get into real estate or even those that are already pretty successful that want to scale up their businesses? For sure. Uh, so, so two things, when people getting into real estate, um, just do it. I mean, everyone always talks about it. it's taking a leap of faith. Um, you know, you're never going to be where you want to be without actually working on it and failure is going to be part of the process. Um, and then, you know, something that I learned back in the day, um, that kind of stuck with me is one of my mentors always told me, you know, there's always somebody out there, you know, trying to take your spot. So if you are in real estate, you are making some money and being a little bit successful, you know, if you're comfortable, there's probably somebody trying to get you. Um, and mm -hmm. that doesn't mean, you know, having to work 24, seven, 365, there's different types of work, you know, s sending out messages and connecting with people on your cell phone is work. So like I said, it doesn't mean go out and swing the hammer, but you know, just, just stay on your toes and, and don't get comfortable. Cause I've been there, you know, I've got comfortable before. So it's not, it's not a fun feeling. Yeah. Yeah, for sure, man. Well, congrats on your success. Only been in it six years and doing the volume you're doing and doing the things you're doing is pretty, pretty amazing. Those are the kind of people I love on my, uh, on, on my podcast here and look forward to continuing your relationship and let me know if I can do anything for you. And, uh, we'll drop a link below for anybody who wants to get a hold of Austin and, uh, check him out and, and get in touch. So appreciate it, bud. Have a good one. And we'll, we'll talk to you soon. Absolutely, brother. Appreciate you having me on, man. Thanks, man. Thanks for listening. Now go to www.remcommunity.com to connect with today's guest, see our high-level masterminds, and to get free resources. Don't forget to share this with a friend and leave us a five-star review. We'll see you on the next episode.